in the last part of Jonah chapter 4, 1438. Last week, we made our way to the middle part of verse 9. And tonight, I'm going to start with verse 9. And so there'll be just that one phrase overlap. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you've had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? All right. Um, having raised five kids means uh, having experienced some of the same issues five different times. Five different ways. I used to think that opposite meant a back either or, kind of this or that. It turns out opposite, like the third one was the opposite of the first two. And the fourth one was the opposite of all three of them, and the fifth one was the opposite of the other, other four. Um, it turns out it's not just binary. Um, you know, we were not perfect parents. I certainly wasn't a perfect dad. But I tried to teach all my kids how to best live life. I also unashamedly taught them things that would help us to have a more peaceful, well-ordered home. It seemed like with each one of them, there was a, a, a moment for learning a particular lesson. And it was when they would have gotten hurt. When they would have said they got hurt bad, the first time. I only remember one of them in particular, but I know this happened with virtually every one of them. And I, I say I remember it in particular. I don't remember who it was. I just remember I was at the bottom of the stairs. I was somewhere else, and I hear a thump and screaming, blood-curdling screaming. So I did what I was supposed to. I dropped everything and I ran to go see what in the world was wrong. Well, what was wrong was they'd hurt themselves. I mean, but it was not really. They hadn't hurt themselves. They hurt, but they weren't injured. <laughs> they had like stumbled, bumped, whatever. That then is the inspiration for the lesson I would teach. And I taught every one of them this. And it basically, in some version of the next time that I hear this sort of crying, if I show up and there's not a pool of blood or a severed limb, we have real problems. This is the kind of crying for when it's life and death. There's a kind of crying for when it just hurts. This is not that. And you must make this better. And they pretty much did. I never had to have that conversation more than once with any of them. I did have to have it once with all of them. But, you know, the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, you save that for hell. That's not for now. That's... <laughs> there, it's, it's not conducive to peaceful homes. To have that stuff. So we learned to do that. I just personally felt like the, the over the top, hyper dramatic way, that's not conducive to anyone's peace of mind and it doesn't make that kid feel better either. So we just didn't do that. But it seems that Jonah had never learned that lesson. I think I used this, this phrase last week. He was just a drama queen. Last week, he, we saw that after he had delivered God's message, he built himself his little lean-to, and he got all comfy so he could watch Nineveh and see what was or what wasn't about to happen. He 
fixed his lean-to. I suppose he found a soft spot in the grass to sit, and he was there. And then, God went out of his way to add to Jonah's comfort level. And a vine grew up over this lean-to and shaded things. So he was even better. And Jonah then was feeling the best that he had felt in all of the days, really, that this book spans. The whole, from you read from verse 1 to this point, that was the best. He was feeling good. He'd done what he was supposed to do. I mean, maybe he felt like God's off his back now because he had done, he had obeyed. Now he's just hanging out. And the vine grows and things have gotten even better. Then a worm came. Isn't that always the way? Isn't there like always a worm? You're always, if things are going good, you're so blessed in your life. And then when things are going great, a worm comes along. And I was going to say it's a bonus. I'm not sure it's a bonus. Things are going so great that we have a lot of time and energy to focus on the worm. And we get good at that. So many times I've had people come up to me upset because this happened or didn't happen or whatever at school. They did and they did this and they were so upset and I'm like, oh, no. And generally I would take them out in the hallway, calm everything down, and we'd have a conversation about it. And generally, my sympathy level for them was a little less than what they might have hoped for. Not that I didn't care, and not that I didn't listen to them, because I did do those things. But generally, I would say to them, you know, it, I, I want to know your secret. And they would look at me with a puzzled look, and I'd say, your life must be fantastic. You must have the most problem-free, trouble-free life I've ever known of anyone. And if you get this one thing solved, it's nirvana. You have achieved the ultimate, and you'll be just, it couldn't be better after that. Now, most of the time, they're kids, and so they didn't always quite track with me. But eventually, I would just spell it out for them. This thing you made such a big deal out of, it's not a big deal. It's a little thing. It's like a worm. It's a little thing. Let that go. Don't just let that go. We act like this thing. If I fix this problem, now I'm going to make this problem so vital, so center of my attention. That's, that's the kind of place I want, like, the thing that if I fix that thing, then everything's great. Not if I fix this thing, it's not going to be noticeable because it was such a little thing to start with. But that's the way people are, isn't it? We focus on the worm. And as though, you know, that's like the biggest problem we got. Jonah did. Jonah was really mad about that worm. And he didn't waste any time to tell God about it. <laughs> he figuratively speaking, he marches right up to God and he just tells him what he thinks about the death of this worm. <laughs> the, the death of the plant because of the worm, yes. Yeah. And so God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah doesn't skip a beat. And he said, yeah, it is right for me to be angry. Even to death. In fact, I'm so angry, I'm mad to death. <laughs> I mean, the verse does this isn't one of those verses you read and you think, boy, I gotta get a Bible commentary out. What's the what's the meaning here? It's like seemingly veiled. No, it's not. Not now. God asked Jonah, is this right? Do you feel good about this? And Jonah says. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel solid about this. I'm so mad I can die. Now, again, we, now we can sit in judgment. 
But think about the last time you were upset about something. Chances are you felt absolutely justified. I mean, I'm, I know you all, and you're a good bunch of people, but I know that's the way that works. With me, too. I was having a, I wasn't upset at this moment, but I was having a debate with another teacher, a lady at school once, years ago. And in the middle of this debate, she said to me, would you just think you're right? And I said, Absolutely, I think I'm right. What kind of a person would I be to stand here and say the things I'm saying if I thought I was wrong? I said, you think you're right. The difference is I am. And I smile at her. Of course, we, we're justified when we, think, when we get upset. Once we've allowed ourselves to be upset, most of us don't sit and think, you know, I am a terrible person. This is completely ridiculous, but boy, I'm still mad. No, we don't do that. We, we justify it. You may have even approached a, a smugness in your feelings at that moment. If, and you know, here's the thing. If, if there's anyone here listening tonight and you can't think of a time like that, then I have a question for you, but you cannot, under no circumstances, you cannot answer anything out loud. <laughs> if you answer out loud after this point, all the problems are on you and none on me. <laughs> I'm just asking you to think, not say. Okay, so think about this. If I were to ask, yeah, I mean, so we've all known each other a long time. I mean, you've all known each other a long time. Years and decades, okay, for some of you. All right, so think about this. Don't say anything out loud. If I were to ask the group to think of each person here in turn, so in other words, you know, here's my imaginary group. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to think, okay, what about this person? Have I ever known a time when they were upset and felt really justified about it? Has that ever... <laughs> yes. If you can't think of the one thing for yourself, and you, if you really wanted to know, you might be able to find somebody honest enough to tell you, well, there was that one time. Because <laughs> that's the way we get. I wish it weren't true, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying we... When I'm upset, I feel justified about it. <laughs> I do, and you do too. The problem is, um, it's at those moments we are like, we are following our own feelings rather than an objective standard. And we don't turn to the scriptures to find out why we're upset. We're just thinking about what we feel like. And then if you're like a kid, or if you're an adult that's grown up and not ever grown out of being a kid, you say things like, well, they really made me mad. They said something to me, and I can't let it go. Yes, you can. No, you don't understand, Pastor. Yes, I do. Well, has anybody ever said anything to you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> How did it make you feel? It ticked me off. <laughs> did I ever let it go? Yes. Sometimes more than once. <laughs> Picked it back up in between. But you got to let it go. It's, uh, we all feel that way. And with, but you can't tell me, and I, I'm, again, I'm speaking to myself. You can't tell me that there's two things true at the same time. One, you serve an almighty God of the universe and you would do anything he asked. And two, it's okay for you to hang on to your anger. One of those things can be true, but they can't both be true together. Amen. It's just not the way it works. We're supposed to be different. 
Nobody ever won anyone to Jesus by being angry all the time. I think it's at, at, at times like this, when we are now back to this story, and we're sitting in the blue seats looking at Jonah, I think we sort of expect God's going to step in and just like, he's going to lay down the law now. Now, Jonah's done some dumb things, but boy, this is it. Now he's in. Enough is enough. That's it. Thus saith the Lord time. But what's God do? He works with Jonah. He reasons with him. He tries to bring him along from where he is to where he should be. Verse 10, but the Lord said, Jonah, you've had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? God reasons with Jonah, see, you found a way to care for a plant that I made. You acting like you're so invested in this plant. I made the plant grow. You didn't. You didn't plant it. You didn't cultivate it. You didn't water it. You didn't do nothing. I did all of those things, God can say. You had no responsibility whatever for it. And it's a plant. You don't think that I should care for a whole group of people. Jonah is standing in judgment over Almighty God because he thinks he is completely justified to be upset about the death of this plant, but that God should respond the way he says to the problems of these people in the city. He's got this kind of like out of phase. And God is trying to work with him. If, again, I, I, I hope that like I don't ever get to a place where I'm as tiresome with my examples, but my life is the only illustration source I've got. I've had any number of people, and they're usually little, try my patience and like say dumb things and when I say dumb things I don't mean they ask a dumb question because you know what they say like you know there are no dumb questions yeah whoever said that was lying there are plenty of dumb questions I can give you examples but that's a different story I've had kids just on and on just annoy me and just look and there are times I'm like okay we're done that young man that was in the paper a week or two ago because he did that false thing. I cared about that young man. I had him in class for a year. And there were any number of times I was in my own head and I'm like, I am done with you. And then the next day I'd come back and God would say, no, you're not. Try again. I'd try again. But God doesn't do that. See, God doesn't get to a point like that. It. <laughs> the, the point when God gets to that is when you stop breathing. That's when God's like, okay. But he's not done with you until you're done. God reasons with Jonah. He tries to bring him along. He tries to get him to see, well, see some sense. You know, he says, you know, you, you're Jonah, you're, you're saying I shouldn't care about a group of people. A group of people, like a lot of people, 120,000 people. And, and God's question to Jonah really answers itself. You know, it, it's, it's not right. You shouldn't be that way. God's really saying, <clears throat> Jonah is, is caring about this plant perishing and uh, he but he doesn't show similar concern earlier in the book of the sailors were perishing Jonah didn't care he was asleep 
or he didn't care whether it said the Ninevites were going to perish. That word, it's the same word in all three of those places. God starts with something that Jonah knows. He's going to work with him. He's going to try to bring him along. So he starts with what he knows, his own opinion about that plan. And then he does his best to take Jonah from there, logically, and tries to get him to come to a place where he should be. And we talked last week about perspective. So Jonah's or God is trying to get Jonah to a place of proper perspective. The, the city is about to perish. 120,000 people are about to die and go to hell. And Jonah is worried about this plant. I was at the end of a band today with my fifth grade kids. And we have a concert that's going to come too soon. I had like three minutes. I'm going to run through one more section and be done. And now it's when the hands come up. And I could just, in a lot of times I will. I just look at them and do this. Why? Well, but I, I thought, okay, surely he's got a good question. <laughs> Talk about not being the beneficiary of 35 years of experience. No, he didn't have a good question. Like, okay, that doesn't matter right now. And then, I, uh, what? That doesn't matter right now. I, and then I found out, like, anybody else got any questions that just waste time and don't have anything to do with what we're doing? Well, then they're smart enough not to raise their hand at that point. That's what Jonah's doing. I got a question about this plan. That plan doesn't matter. There's 120,000 people whose eternal souls are in the balance. That's what matters. Not that. Think about the last time you were upset. The reason you felt justified about it was because you... You were only considering it, basically, from your own perspective. When we do that, we often feel good about bad things. Like, that guy did me wrong, and I'm going to do something about it, or whatever. What if every time something happened that we didn't like, we work to consider it from God's perspective? Is it possible we might arrive at a different place mentally or emotionally? <laughs> Probably. If Jonah had considered Nineveh from God's perspective, well, he would have had to see a nation of people that have fallen short of God's righteous judgment, or requirements, excuse me. But he would have also seen that with, with that kind of a definition, a group of people that have fallen short of God's righteous requirements, well, Israel has to be in that group. <laughs> That's why Nineveh's there. They're they, God used them to judge Israel. In fact, Israel owes more than them because God says, these people don't even know their right hand from their left. He wasn't saying they were like me and have to stop and think about, okay, no. Okay, that way. No, he's saying... They don't know the righteous requirements of the law. But Israel did. Jonah's quick to call for justice when it came to Nineveh. Not so quick when it came to Israel. And certainly not when it came to himself. But how does the book of Jonah end? That is the end. That question, unanswered, just hanging there. That's the end. It's, it's left hanging there for us to consider whether we think Jonah came to the right conclusion or not. In fact, I think it's also left there for us to consider ourselves and our own attitudes and hearts in that. And, and now with that open-ended question there, we sort of become a player in the drama that starts with God's call and ends with God's question. So, this is the 12th time we've talked about Jonah. And what have we learned? Well, Jonah was a prophet. He's named among many great names. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Daniel, Joel, Malachi, etc. 
If we were asked by someone who was curious about the Bible but didn't really know much about it, what is a prophet like? What's a prophet like? Well, we might have had an answer for them. But now having spent so much time studying Jonah over the past three or four months, we might have a different answer for them than we would have at one time. Now we have to admit there must have been some variety. Because whatever you think of Jonah over the past four months when we've been talking about it, he doesn't sound like a prophet much, does he? But nowhere do we ever come to a place where Jonah is thought of as a false prophet. Never. In fact, he's referred to in the New Testament and not in a bad way. And I think that really ought to encourage us. See, we could have a question. What is a Christian like? We could come up with a bunch of different answers. But if we're not careful, you know what I think? I think a lot of times the answer we would formulate would come across in basically a way that says, I mean, if we cut to the chase, a Christian is just a lot like me. I can say what a Christian's like, and everything I give you is like paint a picture of, so it's like you. Well, yeah, I guess. I guess you could say that. I mean, we'd never say that right out loud, and, and we might not think it that way, but I feel like it does come out that way sometimes. If a person is like utterly different from us, it's easy to just be a little suspicious of that person. I think. Maybe you don't feel that way, but I do. I mean, I'm not admitting it's the way I always ought to be, but I do end up that way sometimes. I'll give you an example. I have five kids. They're all grown. I know how they interact with their parent. And I know how I interact with my parent. And they don't do it like I do it. And they don't do it right. Well, that sounds a little harsh, Pastor. Yeah, well, I'm glad none of you ever feel things like that. <laughs> I think we all do that. If we were to take names out of the story and just remove it from its biblical context, I think most of us would be pretty quick to say that Jonah, that, that, that's not, he's really not a God follower. I mean, we wouldn't say he's a Christian because he lived before Christ came. But, I mean, yeah, he's probably not a God follower. He's probably just a pretender. He clearly needs to get his heart right. He's disobedient. He's self-centered. He's judgmental. He harbors unforgiveness. On and on and on it goes. Yet, I ask you, where's the reference in these four chapters to God's hand of judgment on Jonah? Now, you might say, well, the fish... The fish did not uh, digest him. The fish carried him and saved his life from certain death in the ocean. So where's the hand of judgment? Where's God's declaration to Jonah? Listen, pal, you either get your act together or fear my wrath. You don't see that. God deals with him like he's Jonah's father. He's not happy that Jonah disobeys and he does try to get Jonah's attention and he ratchets up the attention getting devices and he ultimately does get his attention but what God does here to me seems a lot more like discipline than punishment. He talks with Jonah. He allows Jonah to talk talk to him. He deals with him. He works with him. Is it too big a stretch to draw the conclusion that God deals with all his children like that? Is it too much to think that he's probably a lot more eager to deal with us and work with us and discipline us than he is to just punish us or write us off? I mean, is it too much of a a stretch to draw the conclusion that God wants to deal with you that way? That God does know when you tell him no 
but that he doesn't just wash his hands of you. That God, your heavenly father, he wants to deal with you and he wants to work with you and, and yes, discipline you at times and have conversations with you. And he will let you say dumb stuff like Jonah did. Sometimes I just think that we are too quick to think that God really is kind of looking for a way to break up with us. That he's just like, really, he's about had enough of us and, and we're on our last chance. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I think that a person can live in close relationship with God and I believe in the doctrine of holiness and I believe that we can live uh, above sin. I, I do. But I also believe that, that Christians should grow. And if we can agree that a Christian should grow over time, well, that implies there's room for growth. And, and if there's room for growth, that implies that we'll be more like he wants us to be next year than we are right now. Amen. If that's true, then the reverse must also be true, that we are less like him right now than he wants us to be. If that's the case, I return to what a comfort it is to know that God wants to keep us. He wants to work with us. He's not looking for an excuse to shove you out the door and be done with you. Do we believe that a person could lose their salvation? Well, yes. If by lose you mean abandon, a person can walk away from God, sure. But I think God makes that just as difficult as possible. I've told Rachel before that if she ever decides to leave me, I'm coming with her. <laughs> I think that's exactly what God says to us. If you ever decide to leave me, I'm going to come with you. Because he wants to be with us. And he wants us to be with him. He won't tolerate sin, but he'll do everything possible to bring us back to a place of obedience and love. I find that quite reassuring. The book of Jonah shows us a sign of God, I think, that's just an awful lot like Jesus. And really, why would we be surprised at that? They're the same. In fact, they're just sitting together, grunting, hanging out. What do they talk? I wonder what God talks about with Jesus. Well, I can tell you what he talks about. He talks about you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? They're sitting around talking about you. Not like teachers do uh, talk about students in a teacher's lunch. It's better. <laughs> In fact, they're praying for you. Jesus is bringing prayer requests to God about you. And I find that to be quite a comfort. Well, next Wednesday, we will not have service because it's Thanksgiving Day Eve. And uh, I want Rachel to be able to fully concentrate on my needs for the next day. So We won't have service next week. Two weeks from tonight, we'll start on first. Pe uh, excuse me, second Peter. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your unbelievable love for us, for your patience with us, for the way you work with us and deal with us, that you pray for us, that you love us. I don't have any reasonable person would have left me a long time ago. But thank you for working with me and for each one of us. Help us to understand that, Lord, and to want to do just a little bit, bit better because of it. And help us, Lord, when we get ready to kind of stand in judgment over someone else to act a little more like you. We ask these things in Jesus' name.
Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you.